All right, come on back in, have a seat. Let's get this thing going. Again, welcome to Generation. My name is Matt. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, I'll just look at the people paying attention. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> No, my name is Matt, and if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, I'd love to after the uh, service today. Uh, just, but again, uh, thank you for being here, uh, everyone in the room and anyone watching online. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Maybe. I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, I also before we uh, jump into our scripture, I did want to just double click really quick on the, the announcement that Craig gave about life groups. So we as a church, we exist to help people, to lead people into healthy relationships with Jesus and each other. And I mean, it's, it's, both of those are vitally important. And I think a lot of times it's easy for us to think and, kind of, and can be comfortable just for us to show up on a Sunday and kind of be anonymous. And I'm, I don't think there's anything wrong with that for a, a season, but God's his love for us and his love to us, I mean, it's best experienced in the context of relationships. And so life groups are like, man, we want those to be the place where we are getting, uh, where we're known, where we're able to give and to receive love. Uh, and so the, if, as you're looking for a group, by the way, we do a quarter system here with our groups. And so the, on next Sunday, uh, quarter number two is beginning and it's about eight or nine weeks long. And so if you want to just, if you haven't tried out a group yet and you want to just jump in, just, just say, hey, we're going to give this a shot, eight or nine weeks, let's just be all in and just, let's just give it a try. And if you join a group and you don't like it, don't worry, that quarter's going to end and you can change into a different group, okay? Uh, <laughs> and if there's, if there's not a group that is available on the time and, or that would work well for your schedule, consider leading one or facilitating one. We provide, we, it's... We're not looking for super all-star people who know the Bible in and out to lead groups. I mean, you have that gift. Like, that's great. But we really want to lower the bar, in a sense, for people just to be able to join a group and circle up around God's word and let, let, let God, let Scripture kind of guide the group. I mean, there's a place for le leaders and facilitators. But we, want, we provide questions, and we don't do sermon-based groups. We do Scripture-based groups that are sermon-supplemented. It's Scripture that's, uh, that we're, we're diving into. And so if you are able to, like, if you have a house that's able to accommodate, a, you know, a good, like, 10, 12 people, whatever, consider facilitating and leading a group. And so um, just wanted to double-click on that plug. Um, again, next week they're beginning, launching again, so it's a great time just to jump into community. All right, so we're going to jump into Acts 15 today. I'm going to bring up our Scripture reader, Mackenzie. She's been preparing for, I mean, probably 45 minutes since she found out she was reading. Uh, <laughs> Mackenzie's one of our all-star. Uh, yeah, give it up for Mackenzie. <laughs> if, if you're in this room, you've probably been greeted by Mackenzie at one point in time. But her <laughs> contagious smile, her spirit, her, she's such an amazing um, per, like value add to the hospitality team. And so... Yeah, so she's great. So okay. kick it off. I'll read the Bible. This is Acts okay. 15. <laughs> okay, Acts 15, 1 through 35. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had been doing through them, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so they could hear the good news and believe. 
God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe we are all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what he, the prophets predicted, as it is written. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For the, these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Then the apostles and elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men cho chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm that we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood of, or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. The messengers went at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. There. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Mackenzie. So, September 29th, 1991. Where were you? Does anyone, write, does anyone know the, is that anyone's birthday? <laughs> does anyone know the significance of that date? Well, you should, because that's the day that 80s music died. <laughs> uh, pss, sorry, if that's news to you, I'm sorry. But yeah, 80s music died, and it died on September 29th, 1991. You see, by and large, 80s music, let me just say, I mean, some of you guys lived through this. I'm actually messing with some, some stuff I might get in trouble for here. But 80s music, by and large, was, it was defined by excess. It was like, it's all about big bands with, with big hair and spandex. I mean, like guys like, like this. It just, I mean, this is what, it, what defined 80s music. Um, <laughs> all right, hold, hold up on this one. Hold up on this. Does anyone know who this band is? Oh, okay, you guys. Oh, shoot. I got to be careful here. Uh, no, but 80s music, I mean, it was all defined by excess. The big hair, the spandex, the, the, uh, the, the lots of keyboards and synthesizers and 15-minute guitar solos that would just get, it was all this stuff. And uh, on the night of Sep 
September 29th, 1991, everything changed. And because, the reason everything changed was because there was a small band from Aberdeen, Washington, who debuted on MTV, their song, Smells Like Teen Spirit. The band was Nirvana. And Nirvana, they arrived on the scene, and based, they essentially said that music was going to be different. It was no longer going to be about all of the hype. It's not going to be about the big hair, the spandex costumes, the layers and layers of keyboards and guitars and 15-minute guitar solos. No, it's just going to be about the music. It was going to be about the music. And Nirvana as a band, I mean, they were able to really strip away all of the excess that was there. And they just were able to make it about the music. And one night through one song, the 80s were over. I actually, on MTV's website, I found this quote from an article that was talking about Smells Like Teen Spirit song, and the author says, it was gutsy and heavy and authentic, and that's what changed the landscape. Nirvana opened people's eyes. In one night, through one song, a rock and roll renaissance began, which ushered in a cultural shift that would come to define an entire generation. Right, where's, where are we going with this, Matt? Um, well, friend, friends, like moments like this where a single moment changes everything, which brings an end to an era. I mean, this is, this, it's happened a lot of different times, but that's nothing new. Uh, just last week, I mean, we celebrated, we remembered it uh, on Good Friday and Easter, we celebrated what God through Jesus Christ accomplished. And in that moment, that, that from Good Friday to Easter that weekend, that moment together, it changed everything. It brought in a completely new era. You see, the cross and the resurrection, in many ways, it stripped back all of the layers and layers of religious excess that existed, all of the, the, the rigorous requirements, the religious excess that stood in the way of people coming to God, all of the noise, all of the distraction about what you need to do and who you need to become in order to, to come to God, in order to belong to God, all of that was stripped away at the cross. You see, at the, the cross and the resurrection, through those, we see the simple song of the gospel. The simple, authentic song of the gospel, that it's about Jesus it's not about all of this extra layers upon layers of stuff. It's about Jesus. It's about, it's about what he has done to save us. And so my hope and prayer this morning is that we would see that. We would, we would hear, our souls would, would sing and savor the simple song of the gospel. That we would, that through the cross and the resurrection, that you know, we've, we would realize that we've been given everything that we need for life and godliness. We've, we've been made complete that the cross and the resurrection actually changed everything. And so I just want to ask, like, just from the get-go here, a simple question. Are you convinced that the cross and the resurrection changed everything? I even ask, are you convinced that the cross and resurrection changed anything? Because I'd say many of us are living as though it didn't. All right, yeah, it, did, it did a couple things, but it didn't do the whole, the whole deal. And so... What we're going to see today is really, I mean, we're, we're going to confronted with, there's a lie that, that is out there that we are tempted to believe. And that lie comes in many forms, but it can be boiled down to this. The lie that we're tempted to believe is this, that Jesus isn't enough. He's not enough. What he did, what he provided, what he accomplished, it's not enough to save me or satisfy me. That something else is needed. So the lie really comes down to this, is that it's Jesus plus something. Jesus plus, this is blank line, it's Jesus plus something that's going to save me, it's going to satisfy my soul, that's going to redeem me, it's going to rescue me. It's Jesus plus something. And we fill that, Jesus plus blank, we fill that with all kinds of things. I mean, there's a thousand, there's a catalog of a thousand different things that we, we fill that with, we're tempted to, to fill that with, and there might even be good things. But... The temptation to believe that Jesus plus something, that we need something in addition to Jesus. I mean, that's, that temptation at its core, it's nothing new. I mean, it's a tale as old as time. 
that you know, God can't be trusted. We need to do something extra. Uh, but what we're going to see today in Acts 15 is just that. This is something that the early church had to wrestle with. And so let's uh, jump right in, Acts 15, and just give you a little brief context. Uh, if you've been with us uh, throughout our journey through Acts, you know, the first missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas just went on, their first missionary journey, they had just returned back to their home church, and they had been celebrating, they'd been sharing all the news of what God had been doing, and it's, it, t- things are going great, things are, things are on a high, things are going well. Um, and then Acts 15 happens, <laughs> and all of a sudden there's conflict. Some trouble arrives. And so look with me at verse 1 here. It says, While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, I'm going to go into just a, a little bit of background um, here to give us some context of what's happening here. Uh, I think we as modern people, you know, several thousand years after these events have taken place, we can kind of take for granted the Jew-Gentile distinction. You know, it's not something that we are faced with on a daily basis. You know, we kind of can take for granted what's going on. But up to this point, in many ways, salvation, God's saving, it was reserved for the Jews. And if you were going to be saved, you either needed to be a Jew ethnically, or you needed to become a Jew ritually through baptism and circumcision. Okay, so that it was, that's, that's the, the, the environment that we are in here. And, but notice, like, it, it's also important to note that the idea that God would open the door of faith to non-Jews, to Gentiles, I mean, that wasn't completely new. I mean, there were numerous places in the Old Testament that talked about God bringing the uh, Gentiles to him. But the question that we're faced with here is this. It's something a little bit more specific. It's, okay, what does God intend to do with the Gentiles now that they're in? You know, surely there's, they're in. Like, okay, great, great, God, you've opened the door uh, to, to Gentiles, but what do, they do, what do they need to do now that they're in? And I think the assumption was that, well, now that they're in, they need to become Jews, so cool, God, you've opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and that door of faith, or, or the invitation now is the invitation to become a Jew. <laughs> and so the assumption was that they would be absorbed into Israel by circumcision, that by observing the law of Moses, that they would be acknowledged as bona fide members of the family of God. But you see, this, this here is it was an old covenant way of thinking. This was life before the cross and before the resurrection, you see, they didn't realize that the cross and the resurrection had actually brought the end to an era. It had brought an end to the old covenant era. The old covenant was now old. <laughs> it was now old. A new covenant founded on better promises has been established. And so salvation is it's no longer exclusive to one nation or one ethnicity. It's no longer about Moses and law-keeping. And friends, like, again, we can kind of see this as like, what's really the big deal here? But this was no trivial matter, as we're going to see. Uh, the danger of smuggling, smuggling the old and putting it into the new, this was a danger that would bring about, it, if, that, if you were able to smuggle old and put it into the new, it eventually brings about confusion. It brings about slavery. It brings about a loss of freedom. And so... It's not about Moses and law keeping anymore. It's, it's about Jesus has finished work. And this was a, a hard thing to probably to realize at the time because of all of the history. But flirting with Moses, as I've heard someone say, flirting with Moses is cheating on Jesus. <laughs> okay? And Paul and Barnabas, I mean, they're not going to stand for it. They're not going to let it slide. So check it out, what they, what they do here. Verse 2, Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. And I wonder, like, man, I wish I could just been a fly on the wall in, that, in the midst of that conversation. Like, what was that about? Like, what were they saying? Like, how were they, what were they arguing? What's cool is that we don't have to really guess as to what they were saying. We, can, we learn, uh, Paul later wrote Galatians, which, which helps us to see a lot of the argumentation that he was probably using here. 
And so we can double click on this and jump into Galatians. I just want to give you a little sampling of these, of these passages from Galatians that help color in some of these details. In Galatians 2, uh, He's calling out Peter for his hypocrisy at one moment, and he says to Peter, he says, You and I are, are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by observing the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. So it's not about law keeping in order to get right and to stay right with God. And it's not about becoming a Jew. Galatians 3, 26 through 28 says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, it's not about being a Jew or Gentile. It's about being united to Jesus. It's a completely new thing. We're used to thinking of in categories and distinctions, but no, it's those distinctions that we typically use are, are not the qualifiers. It's not about being united to Jesus. Well, how does being united to Jesus happen? Well, it's through faith in Christ and what he did at at the cross and the resurrection. So uh, a couple more. Galatians 5, 1 through 2. says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you, that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. So again, to, to smuggle in the law and make it a demand to be kept in order to get right and to stay right with God, and that is to diminish the cross. It's to say that Jesus wasn't sufficient, that Christ essentially died for nothing, because it's still on me. Galatians 2, I think this is the last one. He says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law can make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. So at the core, what Paul and Barnabas, what they're debating, they're debating against a Jesus plus something message. And friends, a Jesus plus something, a Jesus plus anything message is not the gospel. And notice the, the, word, uh, the word vehemently. Vehemently. That, I mean, that's a strong word. And so I, I just want to say something real quick like that. I, while we don't need to be jerks about it, there is a place for contending for the gospel, for contending for the truth of the gospel of Jesus plus nothing. In fact, you know, we always wonder, it's like, what's the hill to die on? What's the hill to die on? This is the hill to die on. And this is the hill that we, a generation, are going to die on. It's going to be Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing, it's, it's, that's, it, that's going to be the hill. It's, it's the gospel alone. It's, it's a, the work of Jesus was sufficient. It is sufficient to save us and to satisfy us. And so it's Jesus plus nothing. Uh, so this issue was so important at the time. They argue it vehemently, but then all of a sudden the, the church leaders, they get together and say, we need to actually... We need to have some unity around this with the, the capital C church here. So they, uh, continuing on verse 2, he says, Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. So again, this was a big deal. It wasn't sm some small peripheral answer or peripheral matter. It, it was something of grave importance that needed to have a settled answer. There needed to be unity around this around this question. They, we needed to know, do Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to be truly saved? I mean, do they need to, to keep the law of Moses? So this is not just, this isn't a, uh, uh, some, these aren't some Jewish cultural practices that are at stake. This is the truth of the gospel and the future of the church that is at stake. Okay, continuing on. Verse three, 
The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers, and they told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. Verse 5, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted The Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So they go up there to resolve this issue. And, you know, right on cue, as they're telling everyone about the story of what God's been doing with the Gentiles. And they've been, the door of faith has been opened to to them. And uh, God is saving the Gentiles. Right on cue, these guys stand up and and they, they assert the same thing. That they need to be circumcised and they need to follow the law of Moses but notice a couple of things. These are Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees were the, really the Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL uh, Christians of Judaism. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. But they were hardcore, uh, very strict about their law keeping and, and rule following. And what's cool, But think about it. This was Paul's background. This is where he came from. And he was like the Pharisee of Pharisees. And so I don't think he's intimidated by these guys. Uh, but what's also interesting is that it says that they were believers, you know, we usually think of the, the Pharisees as like, they don't get it, they're, they're, they're lost, they're, they're, you know, they're stuck in the old ways. No, these guys had, had expressed faith in Jesus, which shows, it demonstrates there is a, it, you can express faith in Jesus, but still carry an old into the new. You're still smuggling, you're still borrowing from the old. But you got to throw these guys a little bit of a bone. I mean, this is all brand new stuff. You see the totality of what Jesus did, did on the cross and the, res, the resurrection, I mean, they didn't realize what was now true because of that. Things had changed. It was a new era. But they still had what I would call a truncated view of the gospel. A truncated view of the gospel, it's always a, you know, it inevitably leads you to a Jesus plus something theology. Because if you have Jesus, just, Jesus is good for salvation, but he's not good for my, my life and my growth and my living, then you're going to fill it with something else. But he's the whole deal. He's the, he's the whole deal. It kind of reminds me, and I hate this. Like you, down, you, go, you get on to the app store, and you go to the app store, and you download an app, and it's free. And you're like, oh, dude, that's so sweet. It's free. You download the app, and you open it up, and all of a sudden, it's like, it has what they call in-app purchases. Are you kidding me right now? To get any functionality out of this app... I now have to buy something from them. I have to, you know, I have to upgrade. I have to do whatever. And now I've just got this app sitting on my phone, taking up space on my phone that's running out of space because all the pictures of babies. <laughs> but so the, 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 the app has no functionality. Yeah, sure, it was free to download, but now I have to pay in order to actually use it. Yeah. You know, like, you see where I'm going with this. It's like, <laughs> oh, praise God that you downloaded the app of salvation. You know, it's fantastic, but now you need to pay in order to really use it. Now you need to put in some of your own sweat, blood, and tears. You need to do some work in order to get any functionality out of this thing. But friends, the the gospel, it's not just good news of a free download that you now have to pay for and you have to work for and earn. No, the, the the gospel is the glorious news that every feature of God's grace has been downloaded, unlocked, and installed in your heart. For free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For free. For free to us at immense cost to Jesus. So now the the question's been raised, and now they're getting into the discussion here. Verse 6. So the apostles and elders, they met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, You all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. I mean, Peter, we remember his story from Acts 10 and his interaction with Cornelius. I mean, he had seen firsthand that God was saving the Gentiles. And he's referring back to that. He's like, you guys know the story. Because, I mean, he came back and he shared that story. God is saving the Gentiles. And he he, he references back to that. And it's probably been about 10 years um, since that moment. But Peter had seen firsthand what God was doing and that the, the Gentiles that were being saved, they weren't second-class Christians because that they weren't Jews. No, God had shown no distinction between the Jews and Gentiles. He continues on, verse 8. He says, 
God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. You see, Peter had seen for himself that salvation, it was not about becoming a Jew or about observing the law of Moses. I mean, he had, he had witnessed firsthand the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentiles at Cornelius' house. It was the same treatment that they had had at the very first Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. But at Cornelius' house, no one got baptized or no one got uh, circumcised before that had happened. No one had kept the law of Moses before that happened. You see, it was, they got the same treatment. And it wasn't because of an external change of behavior. It was because of an internal transformation of the heart. And that comes by faith. You see, God had cleansed their hearts through faith. I want you to think about that. God cleansed their hearts through faith. And what a cool picture of what the gospel does. You know, we've said this before, but you're not just saved and your sins are forgiven, but then you're still dirty. I mean, that's, that, that's a truncated view of the gospel as well. Sure, God, Jesus, you forgave me of my sins, but you didn't actually do anything. You haven't changed me. So we're still the same dirty person trying to live a godly life. No, that, that's, that's a truncated view. You see, at salvation, yes, you're forgiven of your sins, past, present, and future, but God doesn't just stop there. You're also cleansed. Your heart has been cleansed. Why? Well, it's so the Holy Spirit would move in. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in dirty places. And if you're going to receive the Spirit, it's going to to clean house first. Not not just behavior, change your behavior so you can move. No, no, no. It cleanses your heart through faith. And then the Holy Spirit moves in. Friends, that means you are clean and you are close to God. And at times we feel the opposite. We feel dirty. We feel distant. Uh, we all still stumble, we still struggle with sin, with the, we're still in many ways, like we, we feel the tension of all that. But at the core of our being, we are choosing to believe by faith that God, you have made me clean, you have brought me close, that the cross and the resurrection worked. And so Peter, he says that this happens by faith. Uh, continuing on in verse 10, I love this, he says, so why are you now challenging, he's speaking to the 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 gang there. Why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were ever able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus. He's just essentially saying, like, who are we kidding? Why are we going to place this impossible weight on these guys that we ourselves could never bear? And I think it's because misery loves company. (laughs) If I had to carry this weight... So do you. Jesus took the weight. It's finished. So in salvation, Peter's saying salvation is by grace alone. It's Jesus plus nothing. Uh, so i got to hurry here. <laughs> so uh, the mic gets passed to Paul and, Paul and Barnabas, and they share their own experiences of what, what God had been doing amongst the Gentiles. And then uh, James, he wants a turn. Uh, So James speaks up now, and he says, Brothers, in verse 13, uh, listen to me. Peter's told you about the first, the time that God first visited the Gentiles to take uh, from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. And then he points to scripture. He uses a passage in Amos to show that God's plan all along was to include the Gentiles. You see, the Gentiles getting saved, it's not a deviation of God's salvation plan, it's actually its fulfillment. And so, in verse 17 of, of, that, of that Amos passage, or verse 17 of, of um, Acts 15, he says, so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. And so the point here is that it's through these stories that Peter shares, Paul and Barnabas are sharing, that validate and verify that God is at work amongst the Gentiles. And it's not about law-keeping. It's not about circumcision. It's not about becoming a Jew. It's about being saved by grace alone, through faith. And then James stands up and he says, yeah, Scripture verifies that. This is what God's been up to all along. And so it seems, at this point, it seems like a settled matter that Gentiles were to be accepted as full-fledged members of God's family and not required to become Jews or required to follow the law of Moses. 
Well, the question is, what do we tell them? What should we say to them? So he goes ahead and makes a proposal. Uh, James says, it's my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in, in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. And I don't know about you, as you're reading that, you're like, okay, sweet. So it's not about law keeping. It's not about, you know, the law of Moses and becoming a Jew. Okay, so what do we do? Well, let's give them some law. Yeah, but wait, wait, just four things. Just four things. It feels, to me, it feels like a weird contradiction. And like, what in the world's going on? But this is a good time to practice our Bible reading and interpretation skills. And I just want to make a couple observations here. Uh, first of all, friends, remember, this is Acts. And Acts, is, it's a historical account of the church and what God did, like the unstoppable spread of the gospel. Uh, so we have to be careful not to superimpose our own understandings and stuff upon the text. But let's remember here that these are real people in real time learning and growing. They're, they're, they're real people learning and growing in real time. And again, the implications of the gospel, the implications were not automatically clear to everyone all at once. This was a process. And so really what this was, was this was the best thing that they knew at this time, the best instruction that they had for them. You have to think, were these four things, was this the total and complete instruction that the New Testament church needed? Well, no. I mean, if they had thought about it a little bit more, they would have come probably up with a fifth item. You know, the fifth item would have been like, avoid reading Harry Potter books, <laughs> abstain from using Harry Potter as an illustration on Easter Sunday. <laughs> I mean... But they just they whittled it down to four. They didn't have time for the fifth. Love you, Tim. I mean, these are, these are the four things that, they, that seemed important for the time. Are they the perfect and complete things? No. I mean, they're far, far from it. I mean, we see in the other letters that Paul writes, there's far, far more instruction given to the church, especially around the area of sexual immorality. I mean, what we do with our bodies actually matters to God. And that's an important thing that he doubled down, he double click, double downs on like later on in these letters. But this, in this moment, uh, this is what matters. And the question is, I mean, that's what's the first thing. And the second is, okay, well, why does this, these, why are these the things that matter? Uh, things like eating food sacrificed to idols, eating meat, uh, the, the blood. I mean, all of those things, you guys, they were hot button issues at the time. Because you see, for, for hundreds of years, Jews had been following the dietary re, uh, regulations and restrictions of the law of Moses. And because of those, those strict rules, I mean, the idea of Jews and Gentiles ever eating together was almost an impossibility. Okay? So now think about that. And now it's Jew and Gentile coming together in one big fellowship. And, and think about this. When they got together, it wasn't just for one hour on Sundays. No, no, they got together, and they, they just spent life together. It was a lot of eating together, a lot of meals, shared meals. And you bet, like, this was going to be something that they had to wrestle with. And we see Paul, he talks about this whole idea of, of showing deference and respect to the, what he calls the weaker brother. You know, in, in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, talking about, you know, if, if this is okay for one person's conscience, but the other one, it's sin. We have, to, we have to show deference and love to one another in those moments. And really, that's what, this is, that's what they're asking them to do. You see, choosing to abstain from these things would demonstrate love and respect for their brothers and sisters, their Jewish brothers and sisters. And this is, friends, this is what love does. It cultivates within us a sensitivity to other people. Because when you know that your vertical relationship with God is forever settled because of Jesus Christ, you can be set free horizontally to show love and care for one another. We don't have to live our lives in order to get and to take, but we're free to give. We're free. And it's not a burden. It's not a heavy yoke. It's a joy. And so they select some, some uh, people 
to go with Paul and Barnabas back to report on this, and then they write them a little letter here, and this is the shortest epistle you'll ever read here. In uh, verse 23, he says, This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. You ever been around those people that are legalistic? <laughs> you spend like, you all of a sudden start to wonder like, uh, am I, is it really finished or do I need to do more? It unsettles your soul, right? Uh, so they understand this unsettled you. Uh, so verse 25, so we decided having come, I love this, to complete agreement to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, they're, they're behind these guys. They're saying, we're with them. Uh, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. Verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food, offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. I was thinking about that. The, the, and I'm almost done, I promise. Um, I was thinking about that. If you do this, you will do, you will do well. That's a very different message than if you do this, you're going to be saved. If you do this, then you're going to be clean. Then you're going to be close to God. It's a very different message. So you see, friends, what behavior verses are. Behavior verses here throughout and throughout the New Testament, they're not do this in order to become something. It's not about trying to become clean and close to God. No, it's the cross and resurrection did that. Everything changed. And now we get to live our lives expressing, not earning our identity. We get to express what God has done in us. I love that the messengers went at once to Antioch, verse 30, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. This encouraging message. I want to invite the band back up as we close here. The, the encouraging message that, that was received, it was not a, a Jesus plus something message. See, any, any message that points you back to you, <laughs> what you need to do in order to get right and to stay right, that's a Jesus plus something message. And friends, that, that, that's not the gospel. And I thought we would be just good, like, I want to ask, close with just two questions for us to consider and to reflect on. Uh, the first question is this, is, is that, is there something that you still think you need to do to get clean and close to God. When you think about it, is, is there still something that you believe that you need to do to get clean and to get close with, to God? And I just want to encourage you, I, I mean, identify that, but also recognize that don't give in to the lie of Jesus plus something. It's time to, to believe and to receive the truth that what Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection was, was it brought us into union with himself. That if you have Christ, if you're united to Jesus, you are as close to him as you're gonna get. And then we don't feel that, but we're, we're choosing to live by faith that that is true. That the cross, the resurrection, all that Jesus did, all he accomplished, it made us clean and close. And so let's not live lives trying to achieve that but let's receive that and let's walk in that truth. But in, in thinking about this passage and then processing it with uh, in our sermon prep conversations this week, there's also this other category too where it's not I need Jesus plus something in order to get clean and close to God for salvation or to, you know, to, to feel like I'm right with him, but it's Jesus plus something to satisfy me. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe that's the temptation that you're living in. Is that, thank you, yeah, cool, Jesus, that's great. That's my, the religion category of my life or my, you know, that's my faith. But there's still something else I feel like I need in order to feel satisfied in my soul. 
you know, I, I can, I, there, there's, a, a, again, probably an endless list here, but these are just some that came to mind. It's, like it's Jesus plus money, uh, a certain amount of money in the bank account for security or, or whatever it might be. It's Jesus plus my health. It's Jesus plus a, a success in work, success in life. It's Jesus plus that's great, but I, I still need Jesus plus my, whatever it is I'm using for self-medication. I, that's that's my, my thing, my, my crutch. I'm going to thank you, Jesus, for what you did, but we don't see that as enough. I need something else in order to satisfy my soul. Uh, it's Jesus plus my kids turning out good. Nothing reveals my <laughs> inability to believe Jesus plus nothing than sometimes these moments with the kids. It's and then with you, with you all, I'm like, man, I, I want to be seen as a good parent. How can I, you know, like it just exposes my idolatry. <laughs> of, I like, man, I, I want to, I want to look like I have it together here. So it's Jesus. That's great, but plus, I need the kids to turn out good because if there's, if, if they're not, then I'm going to be seen as I'm not a good parent, and I can't deal with that. It's the Jesus plus the approval of people. Again, we can go on and on here. It's not, but the idea, friends, is that it's not just Jesus, and it's not just Jesus plus nothing for salvation. It's Jesus plus nothing for satisfaction, for life. This whole thing is about Him and what He provides. It's Jesus plus nothing for whatever it is that you're going through right now. My prayer is that by the, the Holy Spirit would help you to see what you have right now. Not when you get your act together, but what you have right now and that that would satisfy your soul. May we strip away the layers and layers that we have around making it about our performance, about what we need to do. May we strip away the layers so that people would see not our performance, but they would see Jesus, his sufficiency. And God, I'm just gonna pray right now, Lord, that that, that truth the truth of your sufficiency, your enoughness, God, would break through. And that even areas of our life, God, where we've been hiding the weakness, we've been hiding uh, our limitations, we've been trying to pull ourselves together, we've been trying to either get clean and get close with you, or we've been seeking satisfaction elsewhere. God, may you strip back all of those layers. May we see that it's Jesus plus nothing that equals not only salvation, but our satisfaction. And that when the layers are removed from our life, the layers that are, we've made it all about our performance, that people would be able to see our weakness, but then that would just point to your strength and to point to everything that you accomplished, Lord. So I pray that we would see your enoughness, God, in this moment, in this week. And Lord, convince, convince us, convince our souls that the cross and the resurrection changed everything. And may we live in light of that.